We're ready when you are, Floyd. Okay. Hey, George, how are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for coming. No problem. Glad uh, to be Is this here. your first time in Martha's Vineyard? No, it's not my first time in Martha's Vineyard. Okay. First time sitting in his chair. Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> and the first time to, uh, to our film festival as yes. well. Well, I appreciate it. Well, let's talk about uh, uh, Rustin, your newest project, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're an accomplished uh, uh, director. I'm very familiar with a lot of your pieces, uh, both stage and screen. Uh, talk to us about your process in, in approaching this project, Rustin. What do you mean exactly, sort of? Uh, your research process. Well, uh, well, I, I, I knew about Bayard Rustin. I knew about Bayard Rustin many years ago. And then at one point, um, I, I was involved in helping to create a, a, uh, the Center for Civil and, and, and Human Rights in Atlanta. And, and, and they brought me in to, for lack of a better word, stage in this museum, the Civil Rights Movement. And so I, you know, and so in, in, in the rigorous research that I did for that project, I got to know Bayard, about Bayard and his accomplishments to a greater degree. And then I became extraordinarily fascinated by him and just that he's, he's just such a, an astonishing American figure. I mean, he's like, he's, he's an American, he's an international figure. And, and so I, I went, there needs to be a movie about this. There needs to be a story about this. There needs to be, something needs to be done. And as it turns out, Bruce Cohen called me up and said, oh, we're working on this project about, about uh, Bayard Russell. And then he introduced me to Tonya Davis, who runs a Higher Ground, which is uh, the, 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 the president and, Mich and Michelle's um, production company with Netflix. And so that's how I ended up getting involved. And then just, and then it afforded me the chance to dig more and more and more and more. And it's just, it's a, it's just, a, she's an extraordinary human being, a brilliant, phenomenally brilliant organizer, visionary. Uh, he was a, an out gay man back in 1963, an out version of that, what that meant in 1963. He was close friends with, uh, with um, uh, Martin Luther King. He was, he, was, he, w he was really close with A. Philip Randolph. He actually introduced um, Martin to uh, nonviolence, the, the, the teachings of nonviolence. So he's just this transformational figure that, that was so crucial and the organizing mind behind the March on Washington. And it's just astonishing that somebody that significant, that important, that potent, that powerful, we don't know about. This is true. Um, he was essentially, what you're saying, it sounds like the producer of the, the civil rights, or one of, uh, of the civil no, rights. No, he movement. was. He was, oh, the. He was the, he oh. was the brains. The organizational brains. I mean, you look at, I, at, at one point, I remember, you know, I was looking, when I was doing the research for, for the Center for Civil and Human Rights, you know, I've seen, th there was this big giant tit, and there were these phones there, and there were all these bathrooms, and there were all these water fountains. That's the brain that did that. That's the brain that, so that therefore right in the middle of, of, just in the shadow of the Washington Monument, there's this huge tent where all these reporters can call in stories and do all this stuff. He, every single, every single logistical detail, he and his team of kids, and they were kids, eight, late teens, excuse me, early 20s, put it all together, put it out in seven weeks. Mm -hmm. It's phenomenal. It's, a, phen and it's a, phenom a phenomenal brain and a phenomenal spirit and a phenomenal energy. Mm -hmm. Now, him being an openly gay man at that time, uh, how did that uh, help him or hinder him? Well, it uh, sure as hell didn't help him. <laughs> but how did I, how I missed did, that day what, back what in 1963 they, when they were going, hey, we love gay people exactly. today. So, what did that look like, though? What was his openly gay look like? He was, he was, he was, he I, I think what's really interesting about Bayard is that he was raised in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. To, and he was raised primarily by his grandparents, who were Quakers. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that, the rigidity of thought process that, that frequently comes with a Southern Baptist tradition was, was in, in terms of morality and what is bad and what is good and what is all of that didn't apply to him. And so he, so I think he, 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 he grew up in an environment where I don't think they threw him a birthday party when they found out that he was gay, but there was not shame that was attached to it. Yeah. I think his grandmother is quoted as saying, well, if, if, that, if, if that's what you must be, and that was it. Oh, that was nice. That was, yeah, if that's what you must be, you know. Considering the time. Yeah, very sure. much so. Yeah, so I know you mentioned Higher Ground Production, Barack and Michelle. Uh, they were here last year with um, 
uh, what's it called, Descendants? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what was their involvement? How was it like working with them? It was great. It was great. You know, they, yeah, you know once, yeah, once I turned in my first cut, um, you know, I got notes, and they were good notes. They were smart notes. So it, it, it was fun. It's been, a, it's been a fun collaboration all around. Yeah, they, they were great people uh, when they came here last year. Um, so what key elements are most important to you while you are on set working with actors? I know you're, you're a, uh, considered an actor's director, and I saw a lot of familiar faces in the one clip I did see, and I look forward to seeing it as well. What are some of those key elements you look for? Well, you, I think you have to build, I, I, I like to build a sense of, you know, actors are in essence Im, Im, emotionally making themselves naked. So you want to create an environment where, where they feel safe. And also within that safe environment, it, it, it affords you the chance to, to, to give notes, to, to subtly uh, do things that will help mold, focus, and, and, and allow their performance, performances to take on, on a certain quality. So a surf, safe environment, be, I mean, you know, before I film, every day before, I, before anything happens, I bring the actors onto the set, I clear everybody else off, and it's just me and the actors working on the scene, talking about the scene. I also have a two-week rehearsal period, two to three weeks, hopefully, of rehearsal before we even begin filming, and just so that therefore, if, if, you, if you can build a foundation, if you can build a foundation in which they feel in command of the work and in which they understand what you're looking for and you understand where they are and you can ask questions and challenge them and engage them, then by the time they show up, they show up with a confidence and with confidence, the vulnerability can be exposed in a, in a much freer way. So, uh, so I so that's very important to me. I'm also very invested in, um, in, in a sense of play, in a sense of play. So that therefore the work is not calcified. That the that that every time you you do a take or every time you you do anything involved in the film, there's discovered. There's a moment of unknown that is happening, and that an audience gets just and feels like they're witnessing something that is rare and unique and special, as opposed to something that is being calculated, within an inch of its life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, so what was your transition like? I know you've done, like I mentioned before, uh, tons of stage work and, and tons of uh, uh, screen work as well. What was that transition going from stage uh, to screen, from directing on the stage to directing on, with well, cameras? And I, well, I just, I, I just made, I, 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 it, it, it strangely wasn't that sort of strange for me. The first thing I've directed was Lackawanna Blues mm -hmm. uh, for HBO. With Lee Pather. With with Epatha, yes, and with 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 everyone, with Epatha, with uh, Most Deaf, mm -hmm. with Jeffrey Wright, mm -hmm. with Carmen Dijogo, mm -hmm. with tons and tons of wonderful, wonderful actors, mm -hmm. and um, and so that was that, that was that was the first thing that that I did, and so it was just I just you know I sort of had a a a theater to film uh, dictionary going on inside my head while I was doing thumbs, and I and I instantly felt sort of very comfortable. I I don't quite know. Why? I think because I I I I, I call my I, I call the thing which I the label which I attach to myself more than anything else is a storyteller. Absolutely. And so and so that therefore you're, you're as opposed to telling stories on on stage, you're telling them now on film. Or if I'm a sculptor, I'm telling them with clay. Whatever. It's it's you're just I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's and you, so you. You're, that's all you're doing. That's what you're doing. It's not, I don't mean that's all you're doing in the sense that it's simple. I just mean that's all that you, that's your job. Your job is to somehow animate this world and so that it allows an audience to find themselves inside of it, mm -hmm. regardless of the medium. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Coleman Domingo. Yeah. Uh, this is his first role, his first leading role yeah. uh, in a film. What was it like working with Coleman? It was fine. It was good. You come up, come in, um, has a lot of charisma. He's 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 he has he has a great sense of leadership. Uh, he had done his own work on uh, on, on Biden in terms of finding the voice, finding the mannerisms, and all that sort of stuff. So it was, it was just you you know it's just digging in and just digging in and doing the hard smart work every day. You know, just like everybody else, and surrounding him with a incredible wonderful group of actors. So that therefore. Hopefully it be, it was, and I believe it was. If so, it became an exciting journey for him, as well. So if you're if if you're working with people who are smart and intensely, as invested as you are, it becomes fun. Mm -hmm. If you're working with somebody who isn't as invested, 
that it's 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 a weight that you're having to carry. And I think that everybody it was a, it was a it's a glorious 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 group of actors. So when that's happening, and we, and when you have somebody as committed and as ferocious as he is, then it it you know there's a there's a, a buoyancy that can take place. It doesn't make it easier, but there's a buoyancy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was he your first choice? I'm assuming he was. I think he's an ex excellent uh, uh, choice uh, to play Bayard. Bayard. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. He was. He was. I mean, you know, it's like it's, I, I, the, the period of not knowing. The, the, the period of not knowing on any project is one of the most important times mm -hmm. on a project. Uh, so that, therefore, it, it, I, w w the thing which is what I like the process to be mm -hmm. is more so is you're thinking about the role and then you're working on this aspect of you're talking to the writers or you're talking to whatever, and then. All of a sudden, in fact, you know, the, the idea of Coleman appears, and then the idea of, and then the idea of Coleman appears a little bit later, and then the uh, idea of Coleman appears a little bit later, and then at one point it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a fun process. Oh, okay. What What are some of the things that you learned about Rustin uh, that you might not have known before? That having done this film, you're just like, oh wow, like you know. Well, the most insane thing that I learned about him. I knew that he, he was a singer. He appeared briefly on Broadway in a production that where Paul Robeson was the lead. But the most, but the craziest thing about him is that he did, he, he recorded an album called Elizabethan Songs and Negro Spirituals, <laughs> which is insane. Mm -hmm. It's sort of brilliant, but it's, 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 it's a perfect example of who he was and and where his mind and his spirit and his heart, he, if there was a world that intrigued him, he would journey into that world and bring the energy and the spirit of that world with him. He didn't surrender who he was. He just kept on expanding and expanding who he was. Mm -hmm. It seemed like in the clip I saw, um, and I, I just saw it, there was a bit of intrigue, and it seems like he's being uh, relieved of his duties from, and you, you can fill in the blank, and forgive me for, for not knowing, but in one one of the clips, he's being relieved of his duties, right? Mm -hmm. And that's from the Negro NAACP. Well, no, there was a, there was um, for the nineteen sixty for the nineteen sixty Democratic uh, presidential convention in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, a march was planned because you know it's it's six years after Brown versus Board of Education and the South is just as rigidly segregated as it has been mm -hmm. despite the Supreme Court uh, telling them that uh, integration must happen so they planned this major uh, here Martin Luther King and a. Philip Randolph planned this march that was going to take place a protest that was going to happen in front of the Democratic Convention and there were certain people I don't want to give away too much of the clip but there were certain people certain power players, black power players, who did not want this to happen. And so uh, uh, Bayard made a bold move and offered to resign, believing that people would stand up for him. And they didn't. Mm. And it was, it, it was the beginning of a, of, a, of a rupture between a friendship that we see through the course of the film be healed. Mm -hmm. Who plays Dr. King? Amel Amin, who was a British actor, wonderful actor. Oh, okay. All right. Wonderful, wonderful. Is he new on the scene, so to speak, in terms of a... No, he's done other, he's done other work, but, you know, but he was new to me, right. so, yeah, no, so... Right, yeah, he, he uh... I mean, I meant in terms of American work. He's done a lot of American work? I, 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 I guess, yeah, I don't... I guess, I don't, I don't know. Is he a stage actor? Yeah, he did. He, sta he did. Evidently, he did stage on the West End when he was a kid. So he's, so he's been working since he was about eight or nine. So, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So what are some of the audience takeaways? Uh, you have to ask the audience that. <laughs> that you want the audience to I, I, I want the audience, I want the audience, well, I think one of the things that hopefully what they will see is the, the ferocity of his commitment, mm -hmm. the, the degree of organization and focus that one must have when one is taking on any obstacle Passion is important, but so is an organi organized brain. So is a strategy, and so is building coalitions. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, Mr. Wolf, I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. I look you. forward to seeing okay. Rustin, and I look forward to uh, 
your evening presentation tonight. Well, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, all right, all right, take care. All right.